The story of Monster Hunter 4 and 4 Ultimate are chiefly driven by the Frenzy Virus, a highly infectious and often lethal pathogen that drives unfortunate monsters berserk. It's created and spread by the Gormagala, a bizarre and little-known elder dragon that molts into its adult stage the Shagaru Magala. How does Frenzy work as a virus? How does it move through both its hosts as a pathogen and ecosystems as a wildlife disease? And why would anything evolve such a relationship? Let's dive in to find out. Perhaps the first thing we should find out is what type of virus is Frenzy? Or at least what pathogens it may be comparable to? How does it move through the body and cause further infection and finally host death? Let's start with our symptoms. Frenzy is characterised by the significant production of a coloured vapour from the mouth, by skin and eye discoloration, by behavioural changes of significant aggression and social breakdown, by increased speed and strength, by vocal distortion, and by lack of tissue regeneration. On a surface level, the illness Frenzy appears most similar to is the rabies virus. Rabies is a lysa virus, and it does seem tempting to suggest Frenzy might be similar. It appears to be transmitted via physical contact, typically biting, causing the severe behavioural changes rabies is famous for, and like rabies, it actually has quite a long incubation period. Afflicted animals can be infected seemingly for hours and days before they show the full terminal symptoms. But it's the other symptoms that make me believe Frenzy may have more in common with various coronaviruses than lysoviruses. For one, frenzied animals don't seem to show the same muscle spasms, especially in the throat, and lack of appetite that lysoviruses do. We see the frenzied iopray still eat their dominant male. So whilst, as we see later, regenerative processes are limited, frenzied animals can still eat and drink, and this is crucial for their long-term survival. For another, it seems frenzy may actually not be transferred by saliva like rabies, but by droplets in the animal's breath like a coronavirus, and this explains the vapour. If it was from the salivary glands, we'd expect it to be literally dribbling out. In its terminal stage, frenzy clearly takes a huge toll on the animal with a massive viral offload that we can literally see the colour of the vapour. So the virus may still be spread by biting, but it's not produced by the salivary glands. It's much more likely the constant exhalation of frenzy particles means the mouth will be full of them anyway, and any wound inflicted may spread the infection. Similarly, the close proximity of a violent encounter with another animal makes sure that the opponent inhales at least some of the particles and becomes infected. The behavioural changes encouraging aggression and lack of fear may be to put infected animals close enough to others to spread the virus over physical contact actually being required. The virus attacking and reproducing in the respiratory tract also explains the different vocalisations afflicted animals have as their throat and vocal cords are likely damaged. This also goes to explain the discoloration we see frenzied animals have. These bruise-like marks and red eyes also seem to suggest there's some internal bleeding or necrosis, and this ties in with the lack of healing too. Chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases are illnesses caused by the inhalation of toxic particles, and can have numerous effects on the body. One of them is muscle dysfunction and atrophy. It seems like the discoloration is formed from both tissue decay and lack of repair following the pulmonary illness. The animal's muscles atrophy, and assuming it isn't killed, this likely continues, and it may begin to suffer ulcerated tissues as well. Again, it seems frenzy chiefly seems to infect the lungs and respiratory tract, and this is clearly already a miserable existence for any inflicted animal. Whilst the disease may differ from rabies, the cause of the behavioural changes may be the same, and this is encephalitis, the inflammation of the brain itself. There are two types of rabies, dumb or paralytic rabies, and furious or encephalitic rabies. It's worth noting that some animals inflicted with the frenzy virus are described as acting unusual before they become fully frenzied, such as the quest description for the frenzied tigrex. It's unclear what exactly these behavioural changes are. 
They're not specified as aggression, or surely that's important enough to bring up. But maybe frenzied animals go through something of a dumb or paralytic phase before they lose consciousness, and eventually wake into the encephalitic or furious stage. Encephalitis doesn't commonly appear alongside coronaviruses, but it's also not unheard of, and when it does occur, it can be fatal. For frenzy virus, it may well be a near-guaranteed symptom, and in animals at least, this is likely what finally kills them. But the ensuing mental degradation from encephalitis may also explain the increases in strength and damage output from infected monsters. It's not likely that the frenzy causes greater muscular output, if anything it likely reduces it, but it's more likely that monsters act with far less concern for their own body and long-term survival, and this is ultimately what allows them to hit harder and become a far more dangerous threat. All in all, for any monster inflicted with the virus, it really does seem that death is a release. But not all monsters are granted this reprieve, and some become known as apex individuals, that likely play an important role as disease reservoirs for frenzy. But whilst frenzy is often transmitted via contact with other monsters, this isn't the source of the virus. That is the bizarre elder dragon known as Gormagala, the juvenile form of the Shagaru Magala, that has similar abilities. How and why would any animal develop such a relationship with a disease like this? And who is really using who, the virus or the dragon? It seems like the Magalas are using the virus more so than vice versa, as it's worth noting that as disease reservoirs, elder dragons are pretty poor choices. An ideal reservoir for such an illness would be something that reproduces fast, grows fast, and has large litters. The latter may be true for elder dragons, but as an overall family, it doesn't seem especially likely that they have very rapid life history traits. Or even if they do relative to their body mass, it's unlikely to be sufficient for the virus. It's unknown how this relationship first started, and if it's two fully separate organisms, or something Gore and Shagaru actively produce via endogenization with what was once an external virus. Despite their negative reputation, viruses can actually have a number of significant benefits to their hosts with little negative impact, and can have major strides in host evolution. You can't actually grow a placenta without the help of viral proteins. So in our own evolutionary history, we've used a virus to assist us just as much as Gore and Shagaru do. The seeming lack of instances of the virus being reported outside of Gore or Shagaru does ultimately seem to imply that the virus may well be endogenized to the dragons themselves. It doesn't seem to have a wild type that exists without them. Another point is, how and why do you get a group of cells, like the dander, to behave like a pathogen? The closest analogue to this in nature is perhaps canine transmissible venereal tumour, essentially a sexually transmitted cancer in canids. This is very bizarre, because a cancer may be an illness, but it's not like a virus or bacteria. It's a group of malfunctioning cells in the body, so for this to then become transmissible is very weird indeed. In canids, it's believed this is due to the frequency of abrasions and bleeding during copulation providing a rare opportunity for cell transfer. Something Gore does may provide a similar opportunity for cell transfer, which is that it mass molts, shedding essentially all of its outer skin in a single incident that would create a large cloud of cells that would have good chances of being inhaled by something else. But how does Gore benefit from this? What evolutionary reason could it have for frenzy? And maybe this is from Gore's relatively poor senses. Gore is by no means weak, but compared to a lot of other elder dragons, it's notably less powerful. Coupled with its comparatively poor senses, and the fact molting may be a vulnerable period for Gore, as it is with other animals, Gore may well have turned its skin into a pathogen to protect itself from threats. Now, frenzy may seem like a bit much as a defence. Why contaminate just about everything around you in a full-scale pandemic when most of the other organisms you live with won't pose a threat? If frenzy is a defence, it may be due to an evolutionary arms race. A good example of this might be the rough-skinned newt. Famed for its lethal toxin TTX, anything to eat it is near guaranteed to die. A bit much for a tiny amphibian. 
but some garter snakes have adapted to the toxin and can readily predate the newts. And some findings suggest newts in areas without this predation aren't as toxic. So animals with these extreme abilities aren't trying to kill everything in their environment. They're trying to overcome the defences of something that's resistant to their current abilities. When we look at animals resistant to the frenzy virus, we see this includes elder dragons, as well as a cantor and Yukonlos. We know from Nergaganti and their turf wars, elders will try to predate each other with occasional success. And common elders would also stand little chance against the god wyverns. In its more vulnerable juvenile stage, Gore may be in an arms race to protect itself against other elders, with leapfrogging abilities in Frenzy and the resistance to it over millennia. Few wyverns outside of a Cantor and Yukonlos can resist the initial lethality of Frenzy, and so likely don't get a chance to develop resistance. It may be worth noting too, other elders typically have similar abilities regarding their epidermis and how it's shed. Kushala excretes metal as skin. Teostra and Lunastra shed their own dander they can use to make dust explosions. Nergaganti can regrow its spikes. This constant shedding and regrowing may leave olfactory trails, as well as other behaviours like Kushala's wind blasts. And these are likely important for communication between elders themselves, but may also make elder dragons comparatively easier to detect for other monsters. So it may not just be Gore that developed its unusual skin-based abilities to protect itself, as these all seem like defensive traits. This does seem to suggest that either elders are in high competition with each other, or in the past most common elders were viewed as prey by other animals. It may be possible in ancient times larger, now extinct elder dragons or black dragons were more common or that Akantor and Yukonlos are the last members of a once more extensive lineage of massive wyverns, ones that had no problem taking down elders as prey. Is it possible Frenzy could have negative effects for Gore and Shagarumagala as well? Quite possibly. One variant is the chaotic Gormagala, an individual that's failed to molt and so remains a sterile subadult. It could be possible this is caused by a new strain of frenzy that causes severe detriment to its host. Or alternatively, an individual that can't properly utilise its frenzy, perhaps due to mutation or autoimmune disease and now can't molt properly without it. Frenzy may alter the behaviour of its elder host in certain ways as well. It's unknown what exactly the preferred habitat of Gore and Shagaru is, but it's questionable what there is for them in the upper reaches of the Heaven's Mount. It might be possible that the virus has a stronger hold on the dragon than initially thought, and changes its behaviour to force it to the high elevation environments to better propagate the virus. Pathogens can often change the behaviour of their hosts to suit their own needs. Cordyceps fungus is the poster child for this a well-known phenomenon where it forces its insect hosts to climb to high locations for better spore dispersal. Other pathogens can have less overt methods. Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoan parasite that changes the way the brain interprets risk, and causes animals to lose their fear of felids, which it requires for its reproduction. The Heaven's Mount isn't some lethal trap for them, but the barren areas may provide poorer foraging and cover. And whilst the frenzy virus may not necessarily pilot Gore or Shagru quite like a meat suit, it may still cause behavioural alterations purely for its own gain at possible detriment to its hosts. Frenzy may have started as a common ailment among wyverns and even elders, perhaps something like a skin disease, with Gore being a regular reservoir due to how much it spread it via shedding. One new, stronger, and more hazardous strain may have emerged that caused significantly greater detriment to anything it infected, but that also protected the Gormagala ancestor inflicted with it. Gore that developed this strain had better survival rates, and over millennia endogenized it at least partially, before an arms race began with other elders and wyverns that led to the species we know today. And of course, not all normal wyverns that get infected with frenzy die quickly afterwards. Some become known as apex individuals, and manage to survive despite still being symptomatic. 
What allows this, and is it really better? When we look at the species that can become apex, other than them being large and powerful animals, they don't really seem to have anything in common. We can try and suggest explanations on an individual level though. Zenoga, in the old world at least, prefers mountainous areas that don't receive snowfall like the more northern latitudes, and this seems to be the same habitat that the Goran Shagarumagala both like as well. Zenoga may well have some evolutionary history with the two that's given it at least some partial resistance. Tidal Najarala is somewhat harder, but it may be that snake wyverns are evolutionary distinct from their cousins, and have certain immune functions other wyverns don't. Devil Joe uses dragon element, and this may be an important factor in frenzy immunity. Elder dragons and savage Devil Joe are seemingly immune to frenzy, and it's possible normal Devil Joe's use of the element beats back the virus long enough for it to regain some control, and thus become an apex specimen. For the rest of them, environment may play a factor too. Gore and Shagaru Magala seem to like temperate environments, not too cold and especially not too hot. Both of them are vulnerable to fire. Hot, arid environments may well quickly kill the dander cells that spread the virus, and also help combat infection. Diablos and Seregios are seemingly desert-dwelling animals, as are Tigrex frequently. Gravios are typically found in volcanic areas, and Rajang visits both. These monsters may well be supported by their environment to help them last with the virus. There are no cases of Monoblos infected with Frenzy, and their possibly lower numbers than Diablos, as well as their environment, may reduce any chances of an infectious encounter. But being Apex may not be as impressive as the name suggests. These monsters are still clearly suffering from the virus, with discoloured tissues, vapour and strangled calls. It's unknown how much longer Apex monsters last after infection, but it's likely they still have significantly shortened lifespans and death may well come as a relief to them. As Frenzy moves through an environment, it may affect different monsters in different ways, and some may handle it better than others. And it does seem that Frenzy has very top-heavy effects on ecosystems. The behavioural changes animals undergo likely make them less effective predators, as they're more aggressive and less concerned with actual hunting. So long as populations of abundant herbivores manage to avoid the initial Frenzy given off by the dragons themselves, then they may escape the worst of an outbreak, Similarly, populations of bird wyverns may undergo huge drops of numbers, with entire packs of them wiped out quickly by the virus, and large numbers of the volant bird wyverns dying too. But as said in the hunting video, they show excellent ability to both sustain high rates of regular predation, and also recover from events of mass mortality, just as analogous mesopredators in our own world can successfully do so too. So even if they get hit hard, the bird wyverns likely bounce back from frenzy outbreaks quite quickly. Of large wyverns, Rathalos and Rathian may actually handle an outbreak very well due to their supreme adaptability and unique breeding system. The territorial nature of Raths means they typically force out other individuals of their own kind into poor quality habitats, usually areas like arid or volcanic regions. But in the event of high quality habitat being rapidly emptied by a lethal pandemic, these animals can quickly come in to fill the space. In rapid, large culling efforts of lion, this was observed. A huge drop of numbers in one area led to subadults from poorer areas emigrating in to fill the void. Breeding Rathion in safer, arid areas can also pump out new animals to fill such areas or emigrate to such areas themselves. And it's possible frenzy outbreaks may also act as something of a genetic reshuffle, considering resident animals and their offspring may hold on to territories for very long periods of time. The surprisingly large clutch sizes of Rathian may also help swift recolonization. Whilst the typical clutch seems to be around 3 to 5 eggs, Rathian can lay up to 10. Rathian clutch sizes may respond to competition and prey availability in the area and they may lay more in response to territory vacancies. Alternatively, Rathian may lay naturally large egg clutches, and the amounts we see in game are just the typical number of survivors of these clutches. Considering the amount of both potential chick and egg thieves across such ecosystems, 
The reduction in competitors following a frenzy outbreak may allow for great offspring survival. This was another side effect of the predator control campaigns in South Africa. Whilst initially believed in the competitor-free areas lionesses had larger litters post-cull, it actually seemed that just more cubs from normal-sized litters were surviving that wound up giving this impression. Either way, the flexible breeding and dispersal system of the fire wyverns likely allows them to bounce back after frenzy pandemics much quicker than any other large wyvern. It's things like this, maintaining a firm, constant and successful presence in the ecosystem, that really make you king of the skies, not how many fights you win. On a species level, the fire wyverns will likely be ruling long after their opponents have fallen into extinction. Not all animals handle things equally well, though. The same control experiments found that whilst lions bounced back, spotted hyenas, which are typically more numerous than lions, struggled to recoup their numbers post-cull. In comparison, the Seregios flock may be a good example of something especially vulnerable to such an outbreak. A large number of animals in close proximity to one another is an ideal way for a pathogen to spread, and considering Seregios are usually territorial according to in-game dialogue, the best explanation for a large flock is a seasonal breeding colony. So the frenzy outbreak presumably ruined an entire breeding year for a large colony, and this may well have been a severe blow to Seregios as a species. The full-scale damage of this disruption may never really be known, and frenzy outbreaks may be a reason for Seregios inhabiting arid areas due to the vulnerability of their colonial nesting. Other breeding wyverns of arid areas may also be vulnerable. Whilst Diablos can fight off a virus to become apex individuals, there are no apex specimens of black Diablos recorded. In some animals, there is evidence suggesting that testosterone and other hormones can suppress immune function and Black Diablos are loaded with assorted androgens during their time in heat and being gravid. It may be that the cost of protecting their territory and unborn offspring is that Black Diablos are exceptionally vulnerable to frenzy, and females blighted with it typically perish. But how does frenzy even get to the arid regions of the known world if Gore and Shagaru aren't going there? Well, other species may also be important reservoirs for frenzy, Resilient, aggressive species with massive ranges may well be key factors in spreading the virus. It's unknown if consuming an animal with frenzy spreads it, but if so, then Devil Joe in particular may be a key reservoir. They frequently eat smaller wyverns, and have violent confrontations with larger ones, and whilst these may not be lethal, they still likely allow the transfer of pathogens due to the incredibly close proximity of such confrontations. With its huge ranges, resilience, and dragon element allowing it to last longer against the virus, as well as frequent consumption of smaller predators and conflict with larger ones, Devil Joe may well be a very important key animal to spread frenzy to areas Gore and Shagaru wouldn't normally travel. This may also make them vulnerable to frenzy as a species too. It's just one more factor contributing to their own mortality. For similar reasons, Tigrex may also be an important reservoir species, as well as having the ability to become an apex individual too. Basil juice is something of an unknown quantity here. It has a number of good traits to help it spread a virus, but if it's a scavenger, then like vultures, it may have a superb immune system to protect itself from assorted pathogens. It could be possible basil juice aren't important reservoirs, but rather important members of the cleanup crew eating frenzied carcasses and destroying the virus. Rajang can be afflicted by the virus, but it may not be as significant a reservoir either. Frenzied Rajang likely punch and throw more than they bite, and this may reduce likelihood of exhaled particles being taken in by an opponent. Finally, could it be possible that hunting could have an effect on frenzy too? Well, maybe. One study of a non-hunted population of mountain lions found that feline immunodeficiency virus had mutated to better infect males. Now that they weren't hunted anymore, it seems likely males were selected for due to their natural dispersal so they'd carry the virus to new areas. With frequent hunting in the old world especially, who knows what additional evolutionary pressures may have been placed on frenzy. Evolution isn't static. 
and who knows what shifts may occur in the arms race between pathogen and host in the future. To give my thoughts on gore, as this is also technically the gore video, and Shagaru, I think they're decent. Gore is maybe a bit too goth. I mean, his wings are literally a cape, and he's called Gore. And yet, like many who are goth, it does turn out to be just a phase. I do also wish Shagaru looked a bit more different than just golden gore with horns and eyes, but it's not a big thing. They definitely feel very neutered outside of 4U though. They feel completely pointless in Generations Ultimate without the story behind them. I think it'll be hard to implement them outside of something like an open world game where they can have a full side quest storyline of their own. I think it's very nice a wildlife disease was introduced in Monster Hunter. Even if it's the fairly common super rabies trope, it's still pretty good. It's not something a lot of other worlds would really consider. Thanks for watching. And to once again dive into some comments from last week's video, ouch for Zenoga, almost no one stuck up for it, but quite a few stuck up for Bacidios. Some of you seemed surprised at my claim he was a carnivore, and as far as I know this is the case. It's possible it may well be changed, but it seems this is the general consensus at the moment. If he is indeed just an ore eater, then I take it all back. The most common pro Brachidios argument was the armoured prey theory, that the pounders and slime are to break through the tough shells of things like Uragan and Egnactor. To start off, I definitely feel this is what Capcom are going to try and claim, so it'll likely be canonised in that respect. But for myself, I've never really been big on this theory. A problem here is what Brachidios does once he's killed it. If his jaws aren't strong enough to kill such opponents, he's going to struggle with eating them too, unless he quite literally punches the carcass apart into manageable pieces. This is about as inefficient a feeding strategy as you can hope for, and will also cost a lot of slime, that can either run out or be very expensive to produce. Brachidios will also struggle to shove his head inside a carcass due to that massive unwieldy horn too, so it's not like he can just punch an opening and shove his head inside. If Brachy's jaws can handle armour well enough for him to eat such animals, then why does he really need the pounders to kill them as well? Brachidios also can't really use it in a way akin to venom, that is, punch, step back and let it do its job, as the animals it's targeting are ones that clearly prefer fight over flight. It's amazing how genuinely lucky the Brachidios in the ecology video is that Agnactor was miraculously a second too late charging its laser, because it clearly had no plan on how to deal with such a blast to the face. What's more, this is a lot of evolutionary investment for comparatively little payoff. Animals like adult Yorogan and Agnactor aren't likely to be especially common, and likely not enough that they're the chief sustenance for such a large animal like Brachidios. So for me, I'm not entirely sold on the Armoured Prey idea, but like I said, I definitely think it's the one Capcom will fall back on using, so I'll probably have to backtrack on a lot of these arguments whenever I get to him. For myself personally, I think sexual selection is as good as any explanation. As a bit of an insight to evolutionary ecology, if something's weird and you don't know what it's used for, it's for sexual selection. It's hard to commit fully to this theory though, as we don't know if all Brachy we fight are males. Or females. But we'll have to see what the Icebone book has to say about that. The area of volcanoes in the Old World is sometimes called the Volcanic Belt, and seems to be a large coastal section of land with high volcanic activity, with places like Ingle Isle presumably being a nearby active island. This area originally seems to be forested, and one thing I do feel is that whatever the Brachidios ancestor was, it may have been at least partially fossorial, which is to say a digger. This could partially explain the Pounders, as well as how a Wyvern would initially first develop a relationship with a Protista in the first place too. Grubbing around in the leaf litter is the exact sort of environment where you'd encounter something like that. Interesting, a lot seem to lump Gravios in with Brachidios' potential prey items too, with its greater mass, superior armour, and tenacity to keep going even after its chest is blown open, I personally don't see Gravios folding anywhere near as easily as the Eurogon or Agnactor. Capcom almost certainly prefer Brachy though, and would likely throw Gravios under the bus, but it hasn't happened yet. Anyway, that's enough theorising on Brachy for one day until the Iceborne book arrives in the West. Or I lose patience and find someone who can transcribe the Japanese one. I should also add, I don't want Valstrax as a literal snake. I would want him to show specialisation on a level similar to the Wind Snakes, 
but this doesn't mean no legs entirely. But I was pretty unclear on that, so I'm willing to admit that's on me. There are some redesigns I find quite interesting, as much as a jet dragon can be anyway. And for Nurg's spikes, there is indeed the reproduction theory in the art book, which is utterly cursed. Thanks, Capcom. I'm unsure how much they lend to his combat abilities, though, as we do seem to see other elders don't seem especially fussed by them. Many of you were indeed right to point out there's a growing divide between mainline and portable games, with the latter typically creating the flashy anime monsters and the former making more restrained natural monsters. This, combined with Capcom's lack of care for canon, does make me wonder for the future as this divide only seems to be widening with the new games as well. I definitely have a preference for the mainline entries of the series, but it's still fine to like the more over-the-top aspects of it, as said last week was just an opinion piece. I also think in the early days this difference wasn't that pronounced. Tigrex is a portable flagship, and yet it's perhaps the most restrained flagship of them all. I also think 5th gen was something of a bet hedging exercise for Capcom 2. World was a big risk, and so I believe Ichinose was likely pushed to recreate something with the same, albeit exaggerated, vibes as Portable 3rd, which was their best selling game prior to 5th gen, and so they wanted to try and recapture that success as a backup in case World flopped. I do also agree Fight needs to be placed above design, but at the same time I do also think design is underrated in its importance. Otherwise you can stuff any good fight in and it stops being Monster Hunter. If this is your first video of mine, I hope it was worth watching. If you're interested in more, a good number of the monsters from the series already have videos exploring aspects of their ecology and behaviour. There's a video on how hunting may affect monsters, and a bit of a spicy opinion piece on their design. There's also a Q&A if you want to learn more about the channel, and several other fictitious worlds or creatures that I've done videos on, like Peter Jackson's Skull Island, or Gendy Tartakovsky's Primal. If any of this interests you, consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with like-minded individuals too. Next video will be another non-Monster Hunter one, and I'll put it up to a vote in the community section. So use the next 48 hours to decide if I'll be covering the recent documentary Prehistoric Planet, or the Mer creature from Primeval, and I'll see you for whichever one wins.